appreciate you. I know you have a very busy schedule. Um, I just want to pick your brain for a little bit. Um, and, and really, thank you for making the time. It's an honor. It's an honor to be with you guys. And I love the energy in this room already. So thanks for the warm welcome, ladies. I appreciate it. Okay, so we are talking over the next two days about designing our lives, like really structuring a lifestyle that can support us in achieving and being able to fulfill how we want to live. So my question, my first question is, is what do we have to do politically that supports being able to have the lifestyle that we see for our future? Well, the first thing I would say is not all of the answers are going to come from politics. I'm actually barely a politician. I've been one for, for five months now. <laughs> in, all, in, all, in all honesty, and I, didn't, I didn't exactly know what we were going to talk about today, but this is interesting to me because and before I get into politics, when I was just hearing you talk about structuring a life, right, you know, one of the things that has been such a blessing for me, and I have been given the chance to live the true American dream, Right? My parents came to this country 40 years ago with literally no money. I've gone on to found multi-billion dollar companies, doing it while getting married, raising two sons. My wife has lived her own version of the American dream. She's a successful academic surgeon, a throat surgeon at Ohio State. This country has given us much. And so for me, one of the things when I think about structuring my life that allows me to have the foundation to do this is you don't have to do everything at once, I've found, but maybe there's different stages in which we take on different pursuits. So I had the stage of my life where I got out when I was 22 years old from college. My dad had, you know, I think we, we didn't grow up in great wealth, had gone through layoffs at GE under Jack Welch. I wanted to make it in the system of free market capitalism in America. And so I went out, became, joined a hedge fund, left that, became an entrepreneur, built a big business. But I said, okay, this phase of my life is now over. I'm moving on to a new phase of my life. Same year that our first son was born, it changed my perspective. That's when I started writing my books, observing some of the threats to the American dream that I had lived. And so that was a phase of my life where I, I loved having no plan, not running for office, not doing for a business reason, yes. just speaking my mind openly. And then that led me to the doorstep of saying, okay, how do I take these views and actually drive change in the world with that? That led me to the doorstep of saying, you know what? We're in the middle of a national identity crisis. We've lost self-confidence in this country, especially my generation. I'm 37. I'm the youngest person ever to run for president, certainly as a Republican. I appreciate that. And there's this loss of national self-confidence in my generation, so that's going to give me the foundation to take the next leap. And so I know that, I mean, I could talk about politics, but when I heard about structuring a life, for me, that was one of the, my reflections is, each step that I took gave me the foundation to take that next leap. And the first foundation actually started with the ultimate privilege that I actually had. Right? People, we use this word a lot nowadays in different ways. I don't love it, the way it's bandied around. But I actually, in some deep sense, did have the ultimate privilege, which was my mom and dad, both in the house, with a focus on education and a focus on, you know, faith was a big part of our upbringing, too. That's a privilege that I hope that many kids across this country are given the chance to enjoy as well. So to bring it back to politics, what can politics do here? It can at least get the government out of the way of standing in the way of giving kids that actual ultimate privilege. Yeah. And then ensure that no matter who you are or where your parents came from or what your skin color is or how long your last name is, in my case, you know, it's, it's the truth. You can achieve anything you want in this country with your own hard work, your own commitment, your own dedication, that you're free to speak your mind at every step of the way, that's the American dream. And that's what the government can help us restore for every kid in this country. That is the American dream. And how important is the free speech and access to knowledge to making your own informed dis uh, consent or making your own decisions? And are we, do you feel under attack in this country on that now? I think we are dangerously under attack on free speech on two counts. One is from the government, which I think is the worst kind. You know, where it's no secret now 
I was writing about this several years ago. People called it a conspiracy theory then. Now we know it is a reality far worse than even the alleged conspiracy. Government is using tech companies, private companies, to silence speech through the back door that government could not silence through the front door under the Constitution. That is wrong. It is, and it is based on, I like to get to the heart of it, right? Are these individually evil people? They don't think of themselves as such, certainly. I think that there's a belief in this thing we call the noble lie. It's existed since Socrates. Every society from most of human history believed that the government, the people in charge, had to lie to the people because they couldn't handle the truth. Mm. It's like that. You ever watch that movie, A Few Good oh, Men? Oh, yes. Yeah, you know, anybody watch that movie? Jack Nicholson. Classic. So it's, it's like the Jack Nicholson yes. character is like what I see in the government today, a belief that you can't handle the truth. And, and my conviction is as a citizen, it's part of this political campaign I'm running, you know what? We the people, we can handle the truth. Tell us the truth about the school lockdowns. Tell us the truth about where the virus came from. Tell us the truth about government censorship. Tell us the truth about what happened at every... About, I was in Nashville earlier this week. Tell us the truth about the Shooter's Manifesto that hasn't been released so we can make sure that another one of those shootings never happens again. Sometimes the truth is ugly. Sometimes it's difficult to swallow. That's when we need the truth the most. We need honesty, not in the easy times, because then it's easy. We need honesty in the times when it's actually hard to be honest. That's what I want to restore to government. It's not going to happen with somebody who grew up in that system. It is going to take someone coming from the outside. I think someone likely from a different generation to be able to restore that honesty. And it's, it's like any relationship. You're married, We're I'm married. About relationships too. It's any friendship relationship marital relationship, a relationship between citizens, a relationship between the citizens and their government. Trust is a two-way relationship. And the reason I think today the people don't trust the government is that the government doesn't trust its people, actually. And so I think once the government starts trusting we the people, we the people okay, can say, okay, we'll trust the government back. But when you repeatedly tell people on a diverse range of questions, and many of you may not agree with me on this, and that's fine, but on COVID lockdown policies, on the way the election was handled, on, on one question after another, the Nashville shooter, shut up, sit down, do as you're told. If you defect from that orthodoxy, you're a racist, your social media account's going to be locked. If you tell people they cannot speak, that is when they scream. And if you tell people they cannot scream, that is when they tear things down. And I do not want to see that happen in this country. And that is what motivates me. I'm a, I'm a free speech absolutist. I get to say whatever I want as long as you get to in return. And that's what we share in common. That's actually what unites us even when we disagree most. And if I'm successful, that is what we will restore in the United States of America. I love that. So, speaking of truth, I think you think we can handle the truth. Uh, you have some ideas about the truth, the agencies in FBI, a few others that you don't believe or tell us what you believe. I don't want to put words in your mouth. I'm just, I just did a little bit of research, so correct me if I'm wrong on any point. Um, but I want to know what agencies are you not supporting why, and what's the solution? So, so here's the dirty little secret in modern government. It's not a Republican point or a Democrat point I'm about to make. The people who we elect to run the government are not the ones who actually run the government. Mm. Let's call that out for what it is. Okay. Right? And so, you know, many Republicans, and I'm running as a Republican, will say, oh, failed Biden agenda. I say, you're missing the plot. The elected president of the United States is not actually running the show today. It is a permanent managerial class, what people like me will call the deep state, but call it the managerial bureaucracy, the three-letter agencies in Washington, D.C. They're the ones who wield the keys to power in the what, United what States. Do you, what do you mean by managerial? Um... Means, I mean the people who are never elected, okay, the people who are appointed. 
the people who look at the president, people like me, let's say I come along, how does someone working in the Department of Education or the FBI or the CDC or the FDA, how do they view me? They'll view me as, you know, this is a cute little puppet that comes along every four years. We're going to have a new one four years from now. But I was here long after he, long before he got here, and I will be here long after he's gone. So they're like a little inconvenience that comes along and makes some noise. And the problem is most of the people who fill that position, they're happy to play the part. Many people who go into politics are just attention hungry. You get on cable television at night, call it a day, get a nice round of applause when you walk into a room, it makes you feel good, that's good. But you're a puppet when in fact the real decisions of how we regulate industries across this country, how we're shackling energy production here at home from drilling to fracking to nuclear to coal, those decisions are made by people who you never heard of. I took my son a few Sundays ago. We do these Sunday shows now. I'm running for president in Washington, D.C. I took him to the Capitol. It's a beautiful building. Striking. There's a dome. But I'm thinking about explaining to him what's going on there. These aren't where the laws are made. It's like a museum. It's where the laws used to be made when our founding fathers wrote the Constitution in 1789. But today the laws are being made in the drab government buildings that we would never dare to or even waste our time visiting. It's designed to be drab for a reason. So I think this reduces accountability in government. I think it acts like a wet blanket on our economy. Because if you asked most voters in this country, do you think America should be drilling and fracking for more oil and be a leader in energy production, they would say yes. But it's not the policymakers in Congress that are stopping it. It's the Department of the Interior or the Department of Energy, which is hostile to nuclear energy. And it's designed to be invisible. So this is, what I think, what President Trump meant when he said drain the swamp. I agree with that impulse deeply. But I think we have to actually get the job done. And I think it's going to take a combination no. of somebody who comes in from the outside but knows, how to, knows the laws of this country and how we're actually going to in my view, bring mass layoffs to the federal government okay, in Washington. so let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Where? What You, you mentioned the FBI. Start with the FBI. Okay, let, let's so, talk about it. Uh, so so what, uh, people, find this, people find this extreme when I say it, but you're, you know, you, you, know I, I, you guys seem down for the truth. So <laughs> let's talk truth. We can handle the truth. So, so you can handle the truth. So I recommend a book. My wife is actually reading it. She is a far faster reader than I am, but we read it in bed, so she's ahead of me, but she'll indulge me and let me catch up. G-Man is the name of the book. Government Man. It's a Pulitzer Prize winning book, came out in the last couple of years, about J. Edgar Hoover and the history of this corrupt institution. The same FBI that went after Martin Luther King Jr., threatening him with suicide on the back of blackmailed tapes is now going after its political opponents of a different political persuasion. It is wrong. It is still the J. Edgar Hoover building of the FBI that people report into for duty every day in Washington, D.C. There are 35,000 employees. 20,000 of them have nothing to do with investigating crimes on the front lines. It's a managerial bureaucratic rot. And those people under my watch are going to have to go back and find honest work in the private sector, where, by the way, many businesses are trying to hire for jobs. Great, we got 20,000 coming your way. They're going to find honest work, okay? <laughs> and, and, and so we don't need the FBI. So, so the remaining 15,000, these are good people. They're investigating drug crimes or child sex trafficking rings. But the FBI has been very ineffective, actually. And it turns out there are other agencies, like the U.S. Marshals, which has done a much better job on child trafficking than the FBI has. We can move some of the people there. Greater specialization. The DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, much better at investigating some of the same drug crimes that the FBI is investigating in a separate silo at the same time. Move some of the people to the DEA, to the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network at the U.S. Treasury. These are complex white-collar crimes of theft. Move people with specialization there. And so one of the things I've found in this campaign is, look, I'm, I'm a 1776 absolutist. I stand by the ideals of the American Revolution, and I don't apologize for them. These are extreme ideals to some. They're American ideals to me. But when I say these things to, you know, even many of my friends from college, you know, successful in the business world and otherwise, some of these things sound scary at first. But when I explain it to them, actually, what's really scary is the status quo. Now, we have a group of people who have no accountability to us as the people that are actually wielding the levers of power. If we're talking about excising the FBI, and it will be shut down, we'll shut it down in the first three months when I'm in office, 
it's actually much more practical to even take the 15,000 of the 35,000 and move them such that are we going to have an epidemic of drugs in this country? No, we're actually going to be much better at fighting drug trafficking or child trafficking. We're going to be more effective while also restoring accountability. And I just do not think somebody who grew up in that system is going to get that job done. It's just not going to happen or it would have happened already. I do not think we need another super PAC puppet. I have, selfishly here, but I'm with you all, and I feel an enthusiastic energy of, these are mostly entrepreneurs and aspiring yep. people in the room, right, in their yeah. own ways. We're cut from the same cloth. <laughs> We're the same kind of people where, honest to God, I did not want to ask people, I did not take a tin hand, tin can, hat in hand, asking a bunch of mega donors for permission to run. I didn't want to ask anybody to invest in this campaign before I knew we were going to win. So I've lived the American dream. I have put over $15 million of our family's hard-earned money into this campaign to make sure it was successful. 70,000 small-dollar donors, a dollar apiece, $30 on average, have lifted this up. I was literally, and you said you hadn't heard of me. I'm not offended at all. But many people have not. I was at 0.0% in the polls in March. I'm now 0.0. Like it's not even zero. It's like <laughs> we love zero point zero, and, and I'm now at unambiguous third in the Republican primary in the national wow. poll. Wow! So, so I think we're doing this, and if you guys agree, my whole spirit in this in reviving our country is you don't have to agree with hundred percent of what I say. If you agree with seventy percent of what I'm saying, but you know that you're hearing the truth hundred percent of the time. Now I'm not shy about asking people for help to lift this up because now to take this from having surprised expectations to doing what I believe we can do, have a member of a different generation lead the America First movement forward but in a way that unites this country. I'm a George Washington America First conservative. I don't want incremental reform. I want revolution of the good kind, the American revolution. If you agree with that, then... Yeah, I will ask my fellow entrepreneurs to help us out a little bit. You know, you can go to my website, vivek2024.com. If it's a dollar, it's a dollar. And if it's the max, 6,600, it's 6,600. If it's volunteering, not money, whatever it is. I think that we have a nation still yet to revive. I do not believe, and this is, this is the one message I will leave with you all. It's really important for me to have you walk away with today. We're taught to believe that we're a nation in decline. I do not believe that. I believe that we still can be a nation in our ascent. Mm. In the early stages of our ascent, I hope, maybe not even at base camp, actually, on our way to that mountaintop. And I hope my best days are still ahead of me. I'm 37. My older son won't be out of high school by the time we leave office in January 2033. I want to pass on a country to those two kids and your kids and their generation where we're still that nation, where you get ahead with your own commitment and dedication, where, yes, we're going through hardship. Hardship isn't a choice. Victimhood is a choice. We don't choose to be victims. We choose to be victorious. That is what it means to be American. And that is what we can revive to save this country. And I appreciate the chance to, to talk to you all about it. I see that you, you probably have to roll out. Do you have time for one more question? I think we do, yeah. You do? Okay. All right, because now you're talking about the children. You're talking about, you know, is there, do you think that there is an intentional uh, mechanism to, 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 to keep people separated. Like I heard you speak on reverse racism and, and how that the educational system and the economic disparity play into all of that. And then you were talking about the, the, what you would do with the, the teachers association versus and how that money goes back to the students. And I thought that that is, a very amazing, if you could talk on that, would be a great note to end on because Absolutely. there's a lot of mothers. Oh, good. So, so if this is an audience that cares about education, then we share a passion in common. And I speak both as a parent and as somebody who cares about reforming this system. So I'll give you the redux version. I'll go fast given that the time is constrained, but this gets to the bottom line. 
I think the head of the snake is the U.S. Department of Education. The federal government should have nothing to do with education that should belong at the local level in the hands of parents. That's the first step. Okay. So my view is, you can't reform the beast. <laughs> You, you can't reform the beast. You can shut it down. So I will shut down the U.S. Department of Education, step one. I'm glad you guys agree with me. $80 billion. Put that back in the hands of parents across this country. Get to choose where they send their kids to school. This is actually a real choice. Now here's the reality. Tell you a dirty little secret here again. The schools that spend the most money per student, those public schools, are the ones that have the worst results per student. Think about how mind-boggling that is. So I'm for school choice on steroids. Not only do we give parents the educational saving accounts and the vouchers, and this is a civil rights issue in our time. It may not be those of us in this room. It's poor kids in the inner city of Chicago or Philadelphia that are bearing the brunt of this. Not only can those parents send their kids to the better charter schools and private schools, but I go a step further. If that public school, as in New York City, is spending $40,000 a year per kid, and the charter school that does better is spending $20,000 a year per kid, actually it's usually lower than that, the parents should be able to take half the difference with them, starve the bureaucracy. That $10,000 travels with the kid. Now play this forward. You guys are entrepreneurs, many of you. Put that in an investment account for the kid. Just at normal investment returns, that kid graduates from high school with a quarter million dollar graduation gift. You think about that. What's a better use of money? It's not even close. And then I want the public schools to compete because that starves the bureaucracy. Get rid of the teachers unions. They are what are shackling our public schools from competing with private and charter schools. So now we have competition. Now we have choice. I say add transparency. If you're going to teach it in the classroom, Put it on the internet, and if you don't want to put it on the internet, you probably shouldn't be teaching it in the classroom. Transparency, choice, civic education is the final piece of this. And this is personal to me, right? My parents came to this country as immigrants. My view is that every 18-year-old who graduates from high school should be able to pass, should have to pass, the same civics test that my mother had to pass in order to become a citizen of this country. Wow. Know something about the country to value it. And so I, I just want to say to you guys, Elena, thank you. This is a very warm and kind welcome. I happen to be in South Florida, so you guys were so gracious to make some time for me to be able to spend with you. We are diverse, and I think it's a beautiful thing in our country, but our true strength is actually what unites us across that diversity. That's our actual strength. E pluribus unum, don't forget it, from many, one. Mm. That's what this is about. I promise you, if you guys do your part, speak your mind openly, translate the basic optimism for the country that I do have, translate that to your kids, to your communities. If you're so inclined, help this campaign. That will help me lead the country over the next eight years means the world to me, and I'm so grateful, Eleanor, that you guys welcome me. Oh, thank you all. Thank you for it. thinking thank enough you. of us to stop thank by you. and let me pick your brain. Thank oh, you. thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. Okay. All right. Get the picture. Next president. Okay. Okay. We got that? All right. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. See you. Okay. <laughs>